everybody. Welcome to Go Bold. My name is Jody Atariawala and I'm coming to you from Canadian Forces Base Comox in British Columbia and I'm joined by Captain Brian Aubin who is with 442 Squadron here at the base. Brian, thank you so much for joining me. No worries. My pleasure. Awesome. Uh, so as I do with all of my guests, I start by asking what made you join the military and what made you pick the branch that you did? Uh, joining the military was actually a pretty easy uh, decision for, from my part. Uh, my grandfather, my granddad, they were all uh, flying aircraft. My uncle, my father, flying aircraft. Um, specifically, my granddad, uncle and father all were pilots in the Hercules. Uh, so I decided to follow suit and uh, jump into the Air Force myself. And I ended up uh, lucking out and uh, jumping into the Herc myself. In fact, five of the very same tail models uh, all four of us have flown at the same at one point so it's uh it's been a pleasure to work with the legacy herc and, and and i mean it's been around for a while is for that very reason right so it's uh yeah I, it's i i've got blue blood air force is the way that i need to be and this is this is where I, this is my calling if you will that that is awesome and so you in the royal canadian air force um there have been three different variants of the C-130 in operation. Um, the C-130E, the C-130H, and the newer uh, C-130J, uh, Super Hercules. Um, tell me about the ones that you've flown in. Well, actually predating the E, there was the B model as well. There was four B models. Oh, wow, we had the B as well. Yeah, okay. uh, we had it before those until we upgraded to the E models. Uh, I myself got a chance to fly on three of the, uh, the E models. Uh, so uh, it's been a, uh, yeah, it, it started the training in the E model where they had uh, basically what were steam gauges, quite literally. And uh, they've it's since grown into many different upgrades, uh, whether it be external tanks, electronic flight instruments, uh, and in this case, the air to air refueling capability. Uh, we've even got longer versions of it now. So as, as time progressed, um, the Hercules has gone through a, a whole slew of matter of different upgrades to, to help us continue to, uh, to do what we do here. Right on. So this particular uh, Hercules that's behind you, uh, this one is stationed at uh, in Winnipeg. I that think, is right? correct, yeah. Right. And so this does the air to air tactical air to air refueling mission. Correct. Right. And how about yourself now here at 442 Squadron, um, which model do you fly in and what is your role and function at the squadron? Um, well we fly the H model here and the uh, the capacity we fly is for search and rescue. Um, we basically are watching uh, all of British Columbia up to the Yukon and out uh, a fair ways out the, off the Pacific. The, um, the position that we have here is only temporary measure as uh, we're waiting for the Kingfisher to be ready for uh, the replacement of the, the Hercules and the Buffalo. The Buffalo had to retire a little bit early, so we stepped in and uh, continued the fixed wing search and rescue program uh, to ensure that the, uh, the western side of Canada was being covered appropriately. Um, the biggest thing that we do is we work hand in hand with the Cormorant helicopter and we act as a top cover. So we're basically over top of them and communicating with them and making sure that they are safe while they're out over top of the water. And that's it's a vital component to, to their operations. For us to be nearby is like the big brother just to kind of hang over top and, 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 do, and render assistance if, if even they themselves need uh, the requirement. So, Really interesting. And clearly this aircraft has a lot of capacity. Um, maybe we could just take a little quick walk around of it and you can point out some of the, some of the nuances of the of the H model Hercules. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, as you can see, it's it's got a, a high wing uh, profile, and the high wing itself it allows us to kind of land in austere weather uh, r runway conditions, whether it be gravel or even uh, there've been different aircraft that have landed on sandy beaches. Uh, but it allows the engines to be further away from the ground uh, and uh, basically keep the engine safe from being destroyed in, in those conditions. Uh, we've got four Allison turboprop engines, which basically produce uh, about 18 to 19,000, uh, uh, I'd say, sorry, about 16,000 horsepower. Um, and they are constant speed variable pitch. So what that means is the props, uh, the engines themselves run at 100% RPM at all times. So all we have to do 
is twist the propellers and that allows us to actually further or, or less thrust at a moment's notice. Uh, whereas some of the, the jet aircraft is less efficient because there's a little bit of lag time from the time you apply power to the time you actually receive it. In this case, um, you apply power and you're turning the, the blades and then you get an immediate reaction to it. So it, in that respect, it's really good for the, the search and rescue role. If we have to climb out of a, a valley and we need to get out, we apply power, we immediately not only get more thrust, but as you can see, the engines are mounted right over the wing, so we immediately get more airflow over the wing at the same time, allowing us uh, better stability and uh, it's a safer point at that point. Beautiful. It also sports uh, some external tanks, which give us about 6,000 pounds more extra fuel than what we'd normally carry in the wings, uh, granting us about three and a half extra hours of flight time. Um, the ability to hang in the area uh, to render assistance to those in need is, is a vital component to that. So the ability to carry more gas is, is a good thing, right? Uh, the newer J models, they are also holding search and rescue in Trenton, Ontario right now. They've been uh, recently introduced into the SAR role. Uh, so what happens, uh, their engines are a little bit more efficient than ours, so they don't need the external tanks. In fact, they found out that the external tanks reduces the efficiency of the plane as a whole. So, um, yeah, I, don't, I can't say much more to the J model. That's not my, my bag. In fact, I don't even have a seat on the J model. They've, uh, they've removed the navigator from it, so. Right, right. Uh, on the left, we've got the APU. It's a, our fifth engine. It provides extra power in case we have an engine failure or if we're down to a certain amount of engines. Even airborne, we can have this uh, operational so that we can continue to power all the systems in the aircraft and not have to reduce it. Right. Uh, one thing that's different from this aircraft than the one that I'm usually used to, uh, this door right here is the paratrooper door. This is the left side. And what we'll do is we'll actually raise this and throw in a window. This entire door becomes a giant spotter window. So we have the Sartex Loadmaster, sometimes the Civilian Air Search and Rescue Association. They'll jump into the back here and they'll be able to look down to the ground and use what we call the Mark One eyeball, or if you wear glasses, Mark Two. Um, long story short, it, uh, it, it is an archaic system, uh, and, and, but it is a tried and true system. Like using your eyes to, to search out there, we can see a lot of things. And we've been able to help our reunite families as required uh, whenever we did see them. And we have uh, procedures in place that once we spot them, let's say it's over the water, we drop a smoke, then we have a reference point to use, right? If it's over the land, the navigator may just simply hit mark in the kit and then we can fly back to the same point every single time. So it's, it's a good system that we have. In the newer Kingfisher, it's got all the Gucci kit, and the cameras, and synthetic aperture radar, that's all to come. So uh, I'm excited to see that come in as well. And will you have an opportunity to fly in the Kingfisher? I will, I will. Uh, that is uh, my next step. Essentially, uh, sometime next year, I'm gonna start my training in the Kingfisher uh, and leave this legacy behind. Uh, but until then, I might be one of the last ones. Hopefully, I'm pushing to stay on this plane as long as possible. And it's not because I'm resistant, it's because I've got that family history with this run, right? Totally, so, totally, yeah. I don't blame you, I don't blame you. The, uh, the mainstay, the biggest feature of this Hercules is the giant tail and the, uh, the ramp capability. So that giant tail allows us to have massive uh, yaw capability and pushing a lot of airflow and keep us stable uh, in, in slower, uh, slower speeds. And those slower speeds are required because with the ramp down, it actually uh, reduces the stability of the tail. And so we have to fly at a slower speed. Also, it's a lot easier to spot things when you're slower, to drop things out of the plane when you're slower. And it's a lot safer for the Sartex when they're jumping out, right? So this, when, uh, when we do go flying, this will actually go horizontal and the door will go up and it'll allow us uh, to exit the aircraft. Uh, we also have the ability to roll on and roll off anything with a pallet. Um, to any location, whether it be humanitarian aid, disaster relief, even uh, medical evacuation. We, can, we uh, regularly are called upon to, to help people when there's a, a large fire or uh, any evacuation that is required. And we can stick about 80 people on here without asking questions. We can kind of fit a little bit more. Uh, 413 is renowned for its mission in Sri Lanka where it actually carried in an excess of 300 personnel on the aircraft at one time to try to get them out of the, the bad situation that they were in. Uh, and thus their crest is actually uh, uh, an elephant to, to, to pay homage for the, uh, the Sri Lankan uh, wow. uh, mission that they had. So. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> they would have been packed. 
<laughs> yeah, it was it was shoulder to shoulder. We had straps across everyone. Uh, I didn't get to go on the mission myself, but it was a very full flame to the point where even the flight deck had a whole ton of people inside of it. And wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's super interesting. And in terms of your crew, when you do a search and rescue uh, with the Hercules, the H model, uh, what does the crew comprise of? Like how many people? So um, we've got seven crew that we normally fly with. We've got the two pilots. Uh, basically what happens is you give them bananas, they push a couple of buttons and they, they somehow fly the plane. We're, <laughs> um, everyone knows what a pilot is, I don't need to explain that, right? Sure. The flight engineer is more like uh, the heart uh, where they work with electronics, the hydraulic systems, the fuel systems, and they're basically in every single, let's say your car, the turn of a single key is about 30 or 40 different switches for them to get things systems running and, and bypassing of uh, a hydraulics or even just uh, even just fuel systems and just monitoring the different uh, fuel tanks that we have. So they've got a very vital role in, in making sure that the plane stays upright. They also action all of our checklists. So anytime something is happening, uh, we basically have a, a checklist that we action and they're the ones that are the forerunners for that. We got a helicopter just around the car. <laughs> I don't know if you want to pause or... Uh, that's okay. Okay. Can, uh, I can pivot and take a look. Okay, sounds good. That looks like an RCMP helicopter there. Yeah. It's a very busy uh, airport today. We've got a lot of planes and helicopters coming in for the air show. Tomorrow's going to be a good, uh, good venue for it. Hopefully yeah. the weather holds out and we'll uh, we'll get a good show out of it, right? So. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So we talked about the pilots, the flight engineer. Yeah. I'm right behind the flight engineer as a navigator. My job is actually a more complicated one and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, the loadmaster sits in the back. They're the one that is responsible from anything from the 245 bulkhead backwards. So basically the front cabin door and aft is all of their responsibility. They make sure that everything is tied down, uh, that the, the weight and balance is proper so that we don't have load shifting and so that we're within the limits so that we can actually take off of this plane appropriately. Um, they also are the ones that help me in the back uh, with the SARTEX. The SARTEX uh, or search and rescue technicians are the ones that are the heroes. They're the, the ones that jump out, the basically mobile paramedics. We can drop them into any condition, uh, most conditions, and they are able to render assistance as required, whether it be first aid, stabilization, or in some cases, just giving them, you know, mental peace of mind that somebody is there and ready to rescue them because there's been some times where it's a, a blizzard condition and we're not expecting extraction anytime soon. So we just, sometimes it's, it's best to drop them some support, moral support in this case. Um, in regards to my job, I actually do two jobs. I, it, my job is technically air combat systems officer, but we on the Herc call ourselves navigators because that's our primary role. We do do things forward of the 245 bulkhead, so that's forward of the, uh, the, the crew door there. So it's everything that you would expect from an air navigator, whether it be uh, GPS positioning, systems monitoring, um, uh, communications between air assets, ground assets, that sort of thing. But we also, once we finish that search role, we, and we go over to the rescue role, we end up in the back end with the loadmaster. And not only are we helping the Sartex out, but once the Sartex are on the ground, we're actually the ones that are in charge of calling the bundle drops that we drop equipment to them, or we drop a radio message or anything to that effect. So anything we can strap a parachute to, we can also drop down to the Sartex and, and we become more of a supporting role rather than just stuck in the front like the pilots and the flight engineers. So it's, it's, it's a really nice and dynamic sort of position. Yeah, and speaking of, what is the typical type of equipment that you guys would launch with on a actual search and rescue mission? So we've got anything in the in the plane from uh, a pump kit which will allow a sinking vessel to basically uh, empty the bellows. Uh, we've got um, a toboggan kit, a chainsaw, We've got any sort of survival kit that you could possibly think of, including rifles. Uh, we've got medical gear, water, fuel, base, anything you could think of in a, in a rescue situation that you might need, we've got it stored in these bunions. Uh, in addition to that, we've also got pyrotechnics. Uh, and it's not to say like, 
crazy explosive or anything like that, but we've got flares that uh, allow us to see the ground at night or even illuminate the skies when the Cormorant is flying to give them a point of reference. So that's a lot of what we do in the top cover there. Uh, we also have smokes, like I was talking about. We throw it out of the pigeonhole. There's a little hole in the window and uh, it allows us to mark the water so we have a point of reference. Uh, we've got a, an SLDMB, which is a Sea Locator Data Marker Beacon. It sends out a signal to the COSPAT SARSAT satellites and then it tracks how the waves are moving and gives it a constant signal as to, okay, how is the, the tides moving? How, are the, how is the water actually moving? So then we can paint a bigger picture on the survivors and where they might be uh, in, the, in the water after a certain amount of time. And, and maybe there's an outflow that we're unaware of, right? As opposed to the wind um, that we can, we can measure up in the air. That's awesome. But yeah, that's all the stuff that we throw out. Uh, some of the stuff that we might even use in the plane, um, we, we do have an ELT homer, so we basically uh, tune up the needle to the 121.5 signal and we can kind of figure it out. The 406 beacon, uh, that sends a signal to COSPAT SARSAT and that is able to uh, give us the position right out of the gate. So that's, there, there's no finding, it's our, we know where they are at that moment in time. The other thing that we have is a brand new system that we have in the Herc uh, is called CASAR. It's a cellular uh, system where basically the plane acts as a cell phone tower and is able to triangulate the locations of cell phones that might be in the area. We can even specify, like if we've got the IEMI number of the phone, RCC might give that, the Rescue Coordination Center. Um, they may give us the number so that we can specifically track a, someone individual's phone. 85% of people in Canada do carry phones with them in one capacity or another. So. Uh, to have this capability to be able to triangulate people might reduce the search time significantly. Like let's say we're out in the middle of the woods and a helicopter gets swallowed by the trees. Well, we had no indication, maybe their ELT doesn't go off. But if everyone has a phone or is trying to get a signal, we can instantly be able to triangulate that. So I guess a message out to the public, um, if you've got a phone and you're in a plane crash, keep it on if you see a plane overhead because we're tracking you. Um, only for the cases of search and rescue though, and it's only when we know that there's a requirement for preservation of life that we are allowed to use this program, so. That is awesome, yeah. that is awesome. Captain Aubin, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your career uh, your motivation to serve and some of the way that you guys do search and rescue here at 442 Squadron. Uh, it's, it's an amazing mission and a wonderful calling. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure to have you on this program. My pleasure. Thank you for your support. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you.